G'day guys, welcome to Scotch Down Under. I'm Ken. And I'm the Cubal. And today we're going to do what we said we were going to do in our last couple of episodes. We're going to talk about some history. Oh yeah, because oh, we yeah. like history. So we have a couple of screens in front of us because the amount of history that we have with the dates and names and stuff, there's no way in a living hell that we're going to be able to remember any of it. Yeah, I mean, we, we touched on it in our comparison episodes with the Jamison and the Dimple. So what we're basically doing today is really delving into the history of both because they are so strongly connected. They even are. Though you wouldn't think that there's a solid link between an Irish and a Scottish whiskey, but in this case, they're well and They're completely is. linked, and these families revolutionised not only the Scotch and Irish whiskey industries, but pretty much revolutionised a lot of stuff during the Industrial Revolution. We can't even work out how to pronounce this yet, so it's Kennet Pans, I think as it is. Well, perhaps the T is silent, so it could be Kennepans. Kennepans? <laughs> so we'll, we'll say Kennepans. So Kennepans is a part of land that is synonymous with Scotch whiskey. It's just up from Edinburgh, and it's along the yep. river, obviously, so that's where they had most of their transport before the railway got put in there. The Fourth River. Yes. Um, Not to be confused with the third or the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so in the 12th century, some monks decided to stick a monastery there. They were not only doing uh, salt panning, which was the main thing they were doing at the monastery, other than their monastery stuff, but they, yeah, they were distilling Usabitha. The water of life. The water of life. Which Usabitha turned into aquavitae, aquavitae, aquavitae whiskey. <laughs> and this dates back to, yeah, as we said before, about around the 12th century. Yeah. Okay, so this and is where we same time. this is where we start to get into this. So in the 12th century, the Steins were local farmers in a nearby village, you know, you know in proximity to the monastery. Now, Andrew Stein uh, established a, a distillery in the Kennepins. Uh, in 1720. Early 1720s, and within 10, 15 years, it was the largest distillery in Scotland. Yep. Um, and it is well. <laughs> It is said that the Steins learnt the art of distillations from the monks. Which makes sense since they were next to them. Yeah, and, and yeah, they took over the, the lands of the monastery uh, and obviously continued the practice of distillation. And, and, you know, so they were one of the leading Scottish early industrial families. Um, and, yeah, yeah, massive. Absolutely and in massive. the 1730s, that uh, the Kennepins Distillery was actually the largest in the world. Not yep. just Scotland. So. Yep, that's exactly know, right. Which is absolutely massive. And the cool thing about the Kennepins actual distillery is it's still there today. The ruins of it are still there. And there's actually been a trust that's actually been put together to actually look after the remains that are still actually there. So you can actually physically go there and see the remains of that distillery, which revolutionised. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. I mean, you love the fact that those original buildings are now being tended to so that they don't deteriorate any further. The Kilbaggy distillery, which James Stein had as well, up around the same area. Mm. So you've got the Kennepins distillery and the Kilbaggy distillery, and that was the one that had the first railway connection between the two. Between the two, yeah. yeah. And, and of also, course, the, the steam engine itself was a, a Scottish invention. Yeah, would happen to be right on the site. So where did I find that? So in the in the same region. Yeah. So 1786, Scotland's first James Watt steam engine was located at the Kennepans Distillery. Okay, so not necessarily invented, but it was it was one of the there. first the uses. First one yeah. was put there. Yep. And you know they formed canals as well. Some of the first canals. Some between of the first the two distilleries. Um, <laughs> Yeah, or between the uh, the Kilbaji Distillery and the port. Yeah. So that they could actually transfer it in, you know, pretty much a straight line um, using boats and then obviously yep. put it onto bigger boats and send it over Off the seas. And, and then, yeah, like we said, the first railway line in Scotland linking the two distilleries. And there was a the first threshing machine in 1787 was 
on the farm at Kilbargi. Yeah, it's just... <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Absolutely crazy. It's crazy. Some of the first coal mines were located at the Kennepans. Um, massive farming. Uh, the first continual still. So yeah, we'll go into the, the still, because this is really cool as well. In 1828, Robert Stein refined an early column still design, first designed by a cork man, Sir Anthony Perrier, in 1822, and called it the Stein Patent Still. One of the Stein stills was used until 1829. 1929. So oh, sorry, yeah. They used that still for a hundred years. A hundred years. The same still. That is fantastic. And, and then, then soon after yeah. that, Annis Coffey had improved it. Yeah. The Steins, like, they weren't just doing whiskey, they were doing gin as well. Yes. Um, which didn't actually work out well for them in the long run. And the, the Canapanis distillery actually closed down for a few years. So it was brought from the receivers, uh, it says here, Mr. Thomas Dundas and Mr. Erskine of Ma, and then leased back to John Stein Jr. And they continued distilling uh, until 1825. Incidentally, Thomas Dundas's son was the person who commissioned the first steamship to be built oh, in Scotland. One of the greatest accolades goes to James Stein in 1777 when he exported 2,000 gallons of whiskey to England to be rectified into gin. And this is the first ever record of whiskey basically being exported from Scotland. Even though it's literally just across the water into, the, into England. Yep, yep. The export industry, as far as uh, whiskey goes, is now three billion pounds a year. Three billion pounds. Three billion pounds a year to the Scottish economy. Can I have a little bit of that? Well, we contribute <laughs> to that. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, we are. <laughs> um, yeah, and it also says that the 1779 Kilbaji distillery had an annual output of 3,000 tonnes of spirit. Damn. Around that same time, in the, the late 1600s, early 1700s, in the, uh, you know, the nearby Kilbaji uh, area, the Haig family were starting to build their distilling empire. Yep. So Robert Haig was one of the earliest commercial distillers in Scotland in the early 1600s. Um, and it says here, it was inevitable that these two locally powerful whiskey families would socialize and intermarry in a small area of just 20 square miles. And this came to pass when the great grandson of Robert, which was John Haig, as in John Haig and Co, uh, married Margaret Stein in 1751. So this first generation of the merging of the, the Stein and Haig families um, went on to spawn the empire that is Jamison. Yeah, like we talked about in our Jamison episode, they went over there to look after and manage the Stein distillery in Bow Street and then the Jamison family bought it from Stein and then voila, we have... Jamison whiskey. There was no illusions of happy families that the Steins and the Hags, even though they were connected and intermarried, they were still ruthless business people. <laughs> and well, they would... They were, you know, opposition to each other. Yeah. Even though they were connected. Yeah, even though they were family, they kept family separate from business. Yeah, good thing. <laughs> yeah. Going back to Mr. Robert Haig... So the first record of Haig making whiskey was in 1655, when Robert Haig was hauled up in front of the church elders for starting for daring to distill on the Sabbath. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in 1751, his great grandson John married Margaret Stein. Blah blah blah. Making also they were also making distillery at Kilbaggy and Kennepins, and then obviously they went into Ireland. Um, but the youngest, William, founded. King Kelpie and Siggy in Fife, and it was the eldest son John who founded Canonbridge in 1824. Yeah. Now, Canonbridge um, was pretty interesting because the engineer Anias Coffey, who made Stein's design better and patented it, was immediately installed at the Canonbridge um, distillery. And then. Uh... 1865, John Haig formed an alliance with eight other grain distillers. Uh, so the owners are Port Dundas, Castbridge, 
uh, Glenakil Canvas and Kirk Liston, uh, and they basically formed the Lowland the Distillers. Distillers Company Limited, yes, DCL, um, which over time and through other mergers became Diageo. Yeah, and of course Diageo is the absolute giant. Yeah, English oh, spirits zone, manufacturer biggest, and distribution baddest, in, the winner, in the world. Beast. <laughs> Ridiculously huge. Huge? Huge. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, we mentioned earlier the uh, uh, John and Margaret Jamison uh, moving to Dublin and managing the Bow Street Distillery for the Steins from 1788 to 1805. And then in 1805, the family purchased the Bow Street Distillery from the Steins and John Jr. took, took over the running of the business. Yep. Um, now, Margaret's younger brother, Robert, so Robert Haig, uh, also moved to Dublin where he established the Daughter Bank Distillery in 1795. Um, but it was William Haig, who was the youngest of Margaret's brothers, who founded the Haig Whiskey brand. Robert had married his cousin, Janet Stein, <laughs> and ended up buying out Robert when he ran into some financial difficulties with the Kin Capel Distillery. And so it was Janet and Robert's son, John Haig, born in 1802, who then built the Cameron Bridge Distillery in 1824, where all modern Haig whiskey, such as the Gold Dimple Pinch and the Haig Club, is still made. Now. Yep, and that Cannon Bridge Distillery, which is owned by Diageo, yep, is the powerhouse of DCL's grain division, and with the closure of Port Dundon in 2010, is now Diageo's sole wholly owned grain plant. And from 1998, production of Gordon's and Tonkeray, uh, how do you say that? Tanqueray. Tanqueray gins and Smirnoff vodka has also been based there, and the expander for further as part of a 40 million pound investment in 2007 and pretty much all of Johnny Walker's grain comes from there yes. as well. Yep, they are massive. Oh yeah, look, I mean it's it's just it's so in depth and it's so just there's so much ridiculously to... interlinked and there's just so much to cover with this as well. That's the other thing. Yeah, and it the more you look at it, there's just more levels that go further and further. But when it all boils down, back in the 16th century, you've got Jameson family, the Stein family, and the Haig family, all in the same area, all distilling, all revolutionising production and the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. And just completely revolutionising everything around them to make these massive companies with these massive distilleries and to come out with some amazing liquor. Yeah, absolutely. John Jamison, who's basically not born into the whiskey world, but came into it. Yeah, he was a lawyer. Um, and really embraced it. Yeah, but he brought a lot of innovation and elevated a lot of standards within the industry as well. Yeah, because during know, the Industrial Revolution, everyone was like, cut every corner you can. Get it out. Get the massive get the money of product. In. And he didn't. No, yeah. he was big on quality so like quality in the raw materials so like he used to actually pay more for better quality grain yep um you know high production standards so basically if the whiskey wasn't quite up to scratch dump that start again yep um so he was paying more money for better grain aging his whiskey longer than his competitors and the the big thing you know the old adage time is money yeah, that's right. You know, the time that it sits in a barrel does actually play a part in its final price. And all the guys around him were saying, you're mad, <laughs> you're yep. not going to make any money, you're going to go broke. Yep, and he was also really invested in the welfare of his employees. Yeah. Yep. You know, if people were injured, he would actually look after them really, really well. Which was really rare during those um, times. You know, so he, you know, there was a lot of people that thought that he would ruin himself by spending this extra money and not chasing the quick buck. And now look at it. Um, Can you name another Irish distillery that is, is well, whiskey that is as big as this? Not as far as volume goes, because what we were talking about was eight million, million K 
cases yeah. of Jamison sold worldwide last year. Yeah. So, you know, so 200 years later, along with Haig, yep. still making whiskey. Yep. And he's still, the whole family is held to that tradition of doing it properly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the, the, the vast complex or the Middleton estate. Oh, the Middleton this you know, complex it's, estate. It's huge. <laughs> it's another one. So yeah, the, they have got the, between the three of them, with the largest, biggest manufacturing plants of whiskey and other products, it's just unbelievable. And the scale and got, of these more in, More information here again. Okay, so uh, four of John Jamison's son followed their father into distilling. Uh, yeah, like so we touched in in this John, episode. <laughs> John Jr. was working at Bow Street. His younger brother, William, was working across the River Liffey at Marabone Lane Distillery. Against these guys. So, working in competition again. Yep. Um, and after William's death in 1802, the third son, James, took over William's interest in the distillery, although it still carried the name of William yep. Jamison. And then the fourth son... Andrew Jamison. Yeah. He also family. had a small distillery <laughs> yeah. in Wexford, and he is the grandfather of Marconi, the inventor of the Marconi radio. The wireless radio. Wireless yep. tele telegraphy. Tele yes. And also, one of his descendants was uh, an Irish politician, Ivan Yates. I'm not even sure on, on his significance in history, but it's just absolutely amazing. Jamison and all the others got together, made the Irish Distillers Group, closed all the Irish Distillers down, made all the production in Middleton. Yeah, so there's Jamison, Middleton, Powers, Red Breast. Green Spot, Yellow Spot, the whole freaking yeah. kickaboodle. So they were the biggest in Ireland. And then you've got these guys who pretty much made Diageo, the biggest in Scotland. So they ruled the world in Scotland and Ireland. Yeah. Yeah, so Perno actually bought Jamison in the late 80s? Well, they didn't buy Jamison, they bought distillers. Oh, well, they bought it. Irish distillers, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which covered the whole lot. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, between the two of them, wow. And yeah, so just, you know, basically in wrapping up, so, we, you know, we've sort of covered where that is and how it fits in now. So Haig uh, merged, so basically Haig Distillery, Cameron Bridge, uh, they merged together into Distillers Company Limited in 1877. Um, in 1925, DCL combined with John Walker and Son. Yes. And Buchanan Dewar. Yep. And then in 1986, uh, DCL was purchased by Guinness. Yep. Uh, which basically slinged it over into their... United Distillers subsidiary and then in 97 Guinness merged with and obviously their subsidiaries all came together with a company called Grand Metropolitan uh -huh. to form Diageo. Diageo. Maybe we should just do an, a history episode on Diageo itself. There is a lot to cover with the Diageo history. You know because we reference them quite often in saying they are the spirit giant of um, the world. Well, they um, are. Yeah, yeah, they are. <laughs> so that's something that maybe we should do another one. Let us know in the comments if you think we should do that. Yep, I think um, we should because that, they've done a lot of interesting stuff like yeah. in 1988 introducing single malts when single malts weren't yeah, popular. Look, and, even, yeah. even if there's a, another distillery that, that you know uh, has some amazing history and you, know, you would like us to share that information. Oh, for sure. There's so um, much cool stuff out there. Yeah, let us know and we'll see what we can do. Or well, if you want to explore, you know, what your favourite dram is and you want us to explore the history behind it. Yeah. If we'll, we have to. Oh, it's, it's a hard job, but someone's got and, to do And it. of course, as we are right now, we shall indulge in a dram as we discuss. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've indulged a little quicker than I have. Oh, was, every time I was having a sip, I was like, oh, that is really tasty. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. For sure. All right. So, I think we've covered the basics there. I think we've delved a little deeper than basic. No, um, that, that was the basics because there's a big rabbit hole there to fall down. Oh, look, we could literally do an hour-long episode on And not this. even touch the surface. <laughs> and, and, you know, because there's, there's always offshoots from it. Yep. And things. I mean, it's like, you know, you could even do a fairly 
in-depth history just of Middleton Distillery. Yeah, well, the Middleton, you could do the Cameron Bridge, um, just just all those distilleries around the uh, Sterling area as well. You could do a whole history on just those. Yeah, yeah, there's, absolutely. There's massive information about what they did. Yeah. So, yeah, it's something I think we can look forward to, and hopefully you are as well. Yeah. On that note, until next time, have, have a, a good, good one. one.